the Honorable Karen Evans, who uh, has an extensive background in this community, uh, including a couple of cabinet level CIO uh, positions, uh, extensive background in the private sector, as I mentioned, was the director of US Cyber Challenge, created it over a decade ago, uh, came back into federal service, and uh, is now with us uh, in a current position as the CIO of the Department of Homeland Security. Mr. Tony Scott, the Honorable Tony Scott, who uh, uh, had the opportunity, my apologies, uh, uh, one other key position that Karen had is the same one that Tony had, which was the director of uh, AKA federal CIO at, at OMB. And uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating to have you both on the stage here today. Uh, Tony's background very much in the private sector, a variety of companies, everything from Microsoft to VM to Disney, and, uh, and certainly uh, led the charge during the Obama administration at OMB, uh, shepherding us through a lot of different activities there. And certainly was a proud privilege to work uh, for Tony and work with Karen. And uh, boy, we have two titans on the stage here today with us. Uh, you know, you put these two together and you've got some serious nuclear fusion here to bring us home. They certainly know this subject very well. Karen being a world renowned cyber expert. Uh, Tony has seen it all, private sector, public sector as well. I'm gonna hand it off to you all to take us home. From a microphone perspective, are you guys hearing me any better? Sounds great, Tony. Perfect. All right, Karen gave me a thumbs up, so I'll assume that uh, <laughs> I'm good. So uh, I thought it was a really interesting day and um, a couple of things really resonated uh, from my perspective. One that I know all of you have heard from me many times talk about is this, the notion of technical debt. And we heard about other kinds of debt today too, um, not just technical debt, but also architectural debt. Uh, you know, the technical debt I define is uh, you know, leaving a bunch of old stuff in place that costs more and more and more to maintain. Architectural debt is really about the way things are put together. Um, you might have new stuff, but they're put together in uh, an old fashioned way and that causes uh, issues. And we also heard, um, I think, about security and risk debt. That is, you know, things that haven't been done uh, that could have been done or should have been done to decrease um, you know the security profile of whatever organization we're working with so i thought all of that was a really good uh, discussion and something that we need to constantly remind ourselves about um, and it tied into a concept that was uh, talked about at the end of the day which is cost and I'm forever reminded that, um, you know, cheap sometimes results in higher costs uh, in the long run when you look through the whole life cycle. And, you know, a lot of our procurement activity historically has been on trying to get things at the lowest price. Uh, and we call it technically equivalent in some cases. But what you realize if you've been around for any length of time is that the cost often is greater when you have, when you bought cheap in the first place or you implemented on the cheap. And, you know, the ability to see down the road what the implications of doing something on the cheap now and what it's going to cost you later is an area that I think we all need to continue to focus on so that we don't get in these technical debt, architectural debt, and security and risk debt uh, kinds of situations. Um, as that discussion was going on, I was reminded when I was at Bristol Myers Squibb, we had a procurement team who thought they had really done a great job and secured the lowest cost PCs we could find on the planet. And, uh, and these were 20, 30% below the cost of everybody else in the marketplace. Um, 
Now, what happened is when we got delivery of them, about 30% of them were dead on arrival. Um, about 20% of them ran so hot that our employees were making jokes about using them as heaters in their office because, you know, they were, they ran so warm. And when we looked at it after about 18 months, we discovered that we'd spent a lot more money replacing and uh, handling all of this, these cheap PCs. And it taught all of us, a, I think, a very valuable lesson. Um, I was encouraged and discouraged by the supply chain conversation. Um, I think, you know, rightly so, a lot of focus has been on where things come from, uh, who made them, you know, do we have fake parts? Do we have, um, you know, things in our environment that we don't want there? But I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that whatever we put in place, tends to be there for years and years and years. And the biggest surface area for supply chain risk, in my view, is not necessarily on where things came from or so on, but what happens once things get installed. And so I'd say, you know, as a focus area, we need to, as a community, spend more time on those activities that are, I'll call it the operational supply chain, the, the maintenance activities, the software upgrades, the firmware upgrades, the hardware replacements, the, the people and, and technologies that are touching the systems once they're set up and in place. And, you know, when I look back over a long period of time where cyber incidents come from, and, and where the bad stuff happens, the vast majority are in that space, um, not in, not caused by somebody putting a bad chip in or, uh, you know, some of those kinds of things. So while I think all of that is good, the supply chain risk, I think, um, let's not fool ourselves. You know, the, the real challenges are in that operational supply chain. Um, software bill of material, I thought was great stuff. Um, and it's amazing to me how much progress has been made in that space in, in just a year uh, since we last talked about it here. Um, and I'm really pleased at uh, a lot of the things I heard there. But I would say we need to expand it and not just think about it as software bill of material, but the complete bill of material. What, it, what are all the things in the environment that we're deploying? It's hardware, it's software, it's, you know, suppliers who are doing things to our machines um, in our environments. We really need, you know, a comprehensive sort of bill of material if we're going to manage all of the things in our world properly. Um, so it, I think it's it's not just software, but it's everything that goes into it. Um, it's like thinking of a baseball team as just the players or just the bats and the mitts that they're wearing uh, or the cleats that are on their shoes. Um, and if we really want to understand what a baseball team is, it's the collection of a whole bunch of things. Um, including the plays that they design and, uh, and, and some other things. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep uh, making progress on software bill of material. Um, and then two, two final thoughts, and then I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with uh, Karen. Um, it seems to me that threaded throughout the conversation today and underlying a lot of it were continuous movement towards zero trust, that is narrowing the aperture of um, the surface area where things can go wrong. And I strongly support uh, zero trust, both as a concept, but I think we also need to make progress in terms of managing zero trust at scale, which is a little hard to do today. And also, um, 
expanding the concept beyond the narrow ecosystem that each of us individually may control in our organization. Um, because after all, and I think it was shown in one of the diagrams today, we all participate in some big broad ecosystem today. And for Zero Trust to really work well, it needs to cross organizational boundaries and and um, span the ecosystem in which we participate. And then my final thought is, um, uh, I was thinking as I listened to all the presentations today that depending on who you are, you could be a federal agency, you could be a private institution, you could be a nonprofit, you could be in the transportation business or the healthcare business. And your concerns and um, areas that you're maybe worried about or uh, focused on might vary somewhat um, across all of the um, uh, things that we talked about today. You might want to emphasize uh, or have a stronger emphasis on some things and a little less of an emphasis on other things. And I call it context. It's how do we bring the organizational context into all the models and the technologies and the things that we talked about. So, you know, if you're a transportation company is just as one example, you're going to have much stronger concerns in some areas than if you're a pharmaceutical company or a um, you know, healthcare agency or a bank or whatever. Um, and so uh, in all of this great work that we're doing, I think we need to find some way of modeling contextually who the customer, who the client is, and look at things from both a risk perspective, but also this uh, contextual uh, perspective. It's very clear to me that no agency, no matter how wealthy, no matter what their budget, you just can't do everything. Um, there's not enough people, not enough time, not enough resources, and that context uh, and mission make a, a huge difference in terms of where one should spend energy and spend time, even given all the great stuff we heard today and we should never give up. I'm not uh, suggesting that, that we should. So that was kind of my um, thoughts on the day. I want to congratulate Cisco on doing a great job of putting together a super series of presentations and panelists. Um, you know, this is a don't miss event uh, in my book uh, every time. So uh, thanks for doing a great job. Fantastic, Tony, and I really do appreciate it. And you're right, it was a uh, a beefy schedule from top to bottom, that's for Ooh, sure. I can't hear Luke. Tracy, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Luke. Something's wrong with my, okay. my speakers. Let's. Okay, now I should be able to hear. I was just reemphasizing uh, what a spectacular day it was, a, a very beefy agenda with lots of uh, meaty conversation and lots of uh, really uh, um, top shelf presenters uh, that are just on point and really uh, on top of these various subject matters, one after the other after the other. And I was really happy the way we were able to sort of break it up into bite-sized pieces and the way the flow worked there, I thought was uh, interesting. Tony, I think you might have a couple of questions you want to ask, Karen. Sure. First of all, great to see you. It's great to see you as well, even if it's virtually. <laughs> yeah, it's great right. to see both of you on the screen. The Titans, there they are, right there. I want a screenshot <laughs> of that. We only need a, what a few more, and then it'll be a complete panel. You probably wouldn't get any of us to be quiet on any of these topics going forward. That's right. We can only handle two of you at a time here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
the, the first question I have, Karen, is what's it like being back in the CIO seat? Uh, I thought you had graduated when you uh, took the other job, but uh, it seems like you have a passion for this and we know you're good at it. So what's it like? Well, what's um, really fascinating was one to start in the middle of the pandemic. So that that itself was um, a challenge. But the other part is seeing all the policies and the intent for the policies and how the department has implemented those and how the department has matured maybe beyond some of the policies from the original intent and and how for example uh the lines of business here at the department work together on a daily basis to achieve um oversight and outcomes of the program so i think tony if you were sitting in my seat you would be really thrilled at the the teaming and the partnership across the lines of business here in the department um, to, to really achieve the outcomes that were intended, that OMB gives us outcomes and Congress gives us outcomes that they would like to achieve. And, and I think you would, you would be happy at the maturity of the processes here in the department. Well, that's great. And, and you know, you're now on the receiving end of the other end of the straw. You were on the giving end uh, <laughs> at one point. Um, any thoughts in terms of, you know, what you'd recommend to the next CIO or whatever, now that you're back on the receiving end, what's most yeah, helpful? Implementing the policy she wrote 10 years ago. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, that, that does come up as a question a lot. Um, yeah, so I'll give you a great example, IPv6, right? And the implementation of IPv6 and how that got started uh, during our administration, continued through Ural's leadership and is back again. Um, and it's not really that it's back again, but it's actually, okay, now what's it gonna take to get it over the line and get the dual stacks out of the network? Uh, it, it is um, fascinating to read the policies that then come out and they're citing old policies that you actually signed off for because I know the uh, Deputy Undersecretary for Management will ask during several of these meetings, did you start this policy? Do we have you um, who was, and so from that perspective, it's it's really very insightful. I think another area that um, benefits from having somebody who sat at OMB and now is back here in the seat of implementing a policy is really looking at the intents of OMB circulars, right? You know, near and dear to everybody's heart, A130, um, A123, A11. I think it's a little unusual. The staff was surprised. I think my first week here, they were talking about there's gonna be an update to a geospatial circular. And I said, what, A16, they, they haven't done that in X amount of years. <laughs> you know, we need to be, and so, for for the CIO to understand the importance of how often or not a circular gets updated and then making sure to get component feedback so that OMB can benefit from the components use of uh, geospatial data, you know, could could be um, missed by someone who doesn't necessarily have the understanding of all the circulars. And so I think that's been a benefit. Um, you know, going forward and really understanding how they cascade, how they complement each other and how OMB intends for them to be used together and not separate and distinct going forward. And I think that that, um, I would like to think that that insight from my time at OMB is helping further improve the uh, processes that are already here at DHS. That's great. It's great advice, great thoughts. What are you most looking forward to um, in this role? You've got uh, a couple of months now under your under your belt. Um, what's coming up that you, you're excited about? Well, what's really exciting, so as you know, when you're at OMB, you're influencing departments and agencies that this is the right thing to do, right? And so 
What is nice is uh, in a CIO role, especially this particular CIO role, I have an operations section. And so based on being able to like, you know, I'm sure I'm not saying anything that Luke hasn't experienced about, you know, like if a service goes down, that's bad news. But what also then happens is, is you're moving forward for new concepts, for new types of things. For example, we're very closely partnered with CISA, right? Because of the way that CISA has moved forward. So to be able to implement and show other departments and agencies through our own operations that this is what is intended by the guidance that CISA is giving out to federal civilian agencies, that's very exciting because that partnership you know, it's unique because we're, they're a component within the department, yet they're providing guidance for all the civilian agencies. By us being able to demonstrate that and have that partnership and show them, like I get asked um, often, are you going to be part of the QSMO? Of course we are, we, because they're part of the department and we are going to be implementing those services. How that evolves? Um, we're excited because we have the opportunity to work with CISA directly to show what operationally will work. And I think that was the piece that you were talking about, the operational supply chain, the operational policies. That's what is exciting because I can actually implement and demonstrate capabilities. Yeah, and no, I think if you can do that, it goes a long, long way in terms of credibility for the rest of uh, government you know when i was at microsoft as cio we made a big deal about dog fooding all of our products and services internally before we would put them in the hands of customers and uh boy what a difference it makes if you can do that right uh not only in terms of getting the products and services better but in terms of the credibility with the potential customer base so love to hear that love to see exactly uh, even more progress on that. Yeah, well, we're fantastic. pretty excited. That, that's that's great. one thing that we're really very excited about doing is that partnership with CISA to really demonstrate capabilities as they continue in their role as the QSMO. Excellent. I don't know if we have any questions from the audience or not. I can't really see that. So I don't know, Luke or Anybody, do we have any? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with one that's undoubtedly, it's a little bit along the theme of what uh, uh, um, you were uh, talking about in regards to sort of re-entering into the atmosphere here. Uh, is there anything that uh, uh, surprised you in regards? I remember when I left DHS, went over to DOJ for a couple of years, came back, and I thought to myself, the first thing was, wow, some of these things that were kind of front and center a big deal really been solved right um but uh you know there, there's still a lot of topsy turbulence uh, sort of uh way of operating at dhs that you didn't experience at at, at uh, say doj i'm just curious to know if there were things that kind of surprised you as far as um you know pluses or minuses in regards to uh you know um just being back at a uh, department level uh agency in regards to uh whether it's operations or anything else so i think the question and maybe i'll rephrase it a little bit luke because you have a lot of knowledge also of the department is um some some of the maturity of the processes and i think uh when the department was standing up that's when i was really engaged right so the department was standing up and a lot of things were very focused on planning um, and budget resources making sure that the right resources were there that you had robust planning activities and now um, as the department has matured there are really robust management processes associated with execution and so um you know that are vertical so think of it as being vertical and what now with a new set of eyes coming on board and then and and the background that i have looking across a portfolio yeah. as a whole it's an opportunity for us to look horizontally again and are there some gaps from the execution process that you need to tie back into resource and planning 
And, and, and a great example that I'll give you is OMB is very focused right now, right, on the fiscal year 2022 budget. So we're executing, we're starting on 21, but the department itself and the planning cycle is actually focused now on putting out guidance associated with fiscal year 23. And so between those three lanes, are there some gaps that we can make sure that we close as OMB gives us pass back guidance for 22, as the department is planning for 23, and I think it was both you and Kevin and everyone else talking about looking over the horizon and being able to make sure that whatever guidance is going to come from OMB in future years that the department's planning guidance is taking that in, into consideration. So, for example, artificial intelligence. And have we really looked at artificial intelligence from a resource planning perspective, from a cybersecurity perspective, from a resiliency perspective, and make sure that we have those um, resources being thought about from the components as we construct those resources going forward for the budget. Uh, it's interesting because you certainly have a, a, a sort of a, a dual perspective there coming from where you've been in various roles um, and it's interesting to see uh, you know the perspective of making sure those tracks are laid down there's good planning so that uh, you have the resources you need to implement all these things. One of the things that I can't resist asking about is the cyber workforce, right? And I, I, I know you talk, you've talked about it a couple of times in different forums, but there's probably a lot of people in this forum who haven't heard about CTMS and all the activity that is going on just across your whole cyber game, your, so, your cyber workforce. So can you give us uh, the highlights so that the, uh, the audience is tuned in? So, Luke, thank you so much for that question, because, as you know, you and I are intimately familiar with CTMS and what is envisioned in that. Um, the cyber talent management system going forward is really a way for us to be able to be competitive with private industry. And the real key to that, um, Congress has given DHS the approval to go forward, is, is that it's really going to take people that and so we're calling it the DHS Cyber Security Service, um, is taking them from Title V, which is traditional, oh my goodness, you have to come in through USA Jobs, you have to understand that it's a 2210 with a parenthetical that could map over to the NICE framework that says, ooh, I'm looking for forensics analysis. It, the way that CTMS is set up is, um, you actually come in and you'll come into a system and you'll take an assessment. And the way the assessments are lined out, they map to the NICE framework, but the assessments are gonna say how your skill sets then map up to, for example, um, I am looking for a forensics analysis uh, person. And so as you come through, it'll say, hey, this person is qualified. And then the other piece of what it then does is it maps based on the skills that you come through the assessment to private industry salaries. So when I come through and then I say, oh, I'm going to hire somebody, I don't have to say, well, they're a GS-15 at a SEP-10 to make it this. They actually get paid at a salary rate commensurate with private industry. So they're never going to have a GS associated with them. They're coming through and they're going to be, it's, and it's Title VI, so the rules are being published in the Federal Register. Um, we're a pilot, this is a pilot. And the idea is like, say, for example, a high school kid comes through and they qualify at the highest rate. So that whole argument about private industry and salary and all this other stuff, but we can't compete with private industry, CTMS takes that away. They get all the benefits of federal government service, but they don't have to understand how to navigate through the process. And it is an assessment-based approach. And so the other piece of that is it also then determines what other additional training, what, what's your career path, how to continue to progress through so that we can then retain those uh, people within the cybersecurity service as well. That sounds great. outstanding. Um, I'm sure everyone's gonna wanna know what's the timeline on that to implement that? 
Well, right now, um, because the one piece that we don't have authority not to do is we have to promulgate the rules. <laughs> we do have to publish them in the Federal Register and we do have sure. to get feedback. So the Chico is doing that, but mm -hmm. um, and working with Office of Management and Budget. So we anticipate that the pilot will run in May. And that's wow. when we're going to do our first cohort coming through. How many slides do you think you'll get in that first uh, group? Well, D, um, we have in the OCIO uh, office have designated 40 slots and CISA has designated 100. So, we, yeah, we're kind of hoping that we max out as soon as we start so that uh, a lot of the parts of what we're doing here within the department into one of our other big initiatives is the NOSC, which is the Network Operations Security Center, where we're doing this uh, security operations center optimization and then moving it into this operational new entity, which is going to keep the operations up but keeping network operations and security operations together. So we are staffing for the future. So based on that, we're looking for the right mix between contractors and federal employees so that we can actually then run people and positions our ideas to be able to hire them through the CTMS process. That sounds exciting. Yeah, but that's, sounds... that's something we're really very excited about. And that again, takes partnership with Chico, our Chico group. And so we're intimately working with them on the assessment tools and how to map that. And then um, I think if I took the assessment, I would find out that I shouldn't be uh, a network person trying to keep the network up. I think that might be a skill set that I'm going to have to go back and get more training for if they put me in networks uh, operations on the first tier. So um, it's pretty robust and, and we're pretty excited about it. Yeah, I guess based on an assessment, you, you might be uh, relegated to the second shift of, of the Knox first tier, right? Yes, I'm I know I would you. be. I'd be on the third shift. <laughs> hey, um, uh, you, you, you talked about budget formulation. Let's talk a little bit about budget execution. You know, there's this discussion out there about, you know, should the, uh, you know, as, as we sort of uh, all, uh, I say we, you all, kind of, you know, your budget's taking a little bit of a haircut there uh, in regards to uh, tightening up the belt uh, on the budget. And, uh, you know, the IT budget being sort of, motion inside of the CIO's organization. And then in some cases, I'm not saying you all are doing this, but you know, it's one of these, well, we're just gonna kind of peanut butter spread that and everyone's gonna take a hit and that's how we're gonna find our 20% versus, you know, no, we're gonna fence this over here and make sure that we, we, we keep good, strong security. As Tony said, you know, we don't wanna pay for it later, right? It's the, uh, it's the most expensive $10 we'll ever save kind of thing. What's your thought on that, Karen, and, and or Tony, both of you actually, it's just sort of a, the best way that you all have found to kind of manage that kind of situation. As you kind of, everyone's competing for resources and the cyber stuff is always, uh, always important. Well, I'm gonna let Tony go first and then I'll tell him how I'm living some of it right now based on uh, <laughs> current OMB guidance. So I'll let Tony go first. That's a great question. You know, as a CIO, I wish I had a nickel for every time I was told go cut 10%. Um, I, I have a lot more money than I, I do at the moment. Um, but probably the big lesson I've learned is, you know, as a CIO, you've got lots of tools at your disposal and there's the easy things to cut. Um, there are the things that you can cut quickly. Um, and then there's the right things. And um, I've always guided the teams to say, you know, if we're going to cut, let's do cuts that are a sustainable and are not going to sort of boomerang around and come back and, and whack us in six months or a year or two years. Um, and so, you know, in traditional terms, the easy things to cut are, you know, the new application development budgets, the capabilities that you prioritized a few months easier earlier um, are easy to cut, you know, because they're just started. They maybe haven't delivered on all the things that they were supposed to deliver. And it's easy to, in some cases, walk away from those. 
but it, you're walking away from your future in some sense. So I like to look at and challenge the teams to say, what are the you know sustainable, wasteful, permanent kinds of things that we could do that in the long run would actually make us better and, and are not gonna result in um, uh, you know, problems down the road. Now, in some cases, what that's meant is actually doing an upgrade of some existing technology. Um, not to beat their horn, but uh, EMC came to me one time with just such a proposal, and they said, we know you're facing a big budget cut. If you spend a little money with us, we can help you save a lot more. Um, and similarly, other big tech companies have worked with me in the past to do those kinds of things. And so that's where I'd like to focus my efforts. And uh, my advice would be don't go do the short, easy things, because usually that comes back uh, to haunt you in a, in a big, bad, brutal way. And, and I've done it you know, because I had to. And it's either come back to bite me or bite my successor. And believe me, every one of them's let me know about it. Uh, right, it, the, the small investments that have large gains, and yeah, you're talking about opportunity cost, right? You, you just don't have enough cash in the bank to go after something, even though you know it's the right thing to do. Uh, and so you're scraping nickels together, and yeah, all of a sudden, you know, two years later, it's whacking me on the back of the head, or two months later. All right, Karen, give it to us straight. Tell us what the real okay. world's like over there right now. Well, and so, um, at the department, the one of the challenges, and I think Tony, you saw this from an OMB perspective this year, this fiscal year going forward in 21, the working capital fund, as in many other departments, has now gone away. There is no working capital fund at the department. So based on that, depending on what your funding streams are, what we've um, had to do is actually go back to, and we're going through the exercise right now of zero-based budgeting. So to Tony's point is really knowing what services and what do they cost and what and how you are then providing uh, service to the customer. So it's really knowing what the operational costs are for the services. And then that then gives you the ability to say, okay, we can gain some efficiencies here. Um, some of the activity that was started prior to my arrival under the leadership of the deputy CIO now, acting CIO Beth Capello, was really analyzing all the contracts that were currently in place at the department and doing some uh, basic analysis of contracts and services provided and is there duplication across all the contracts. So there are simple things to Tony's point of um, doing enterprise licensing and then doing the strategic sourcing associated with that so that you can drive down the cost so as vendors are doing work within the department that we are overall optimizing the cost and so um, not competing against one another but that we're getting the best price and the lowest price for everyone who is using those contracts so those efforts are underway and there's like three enterprise licenses that we're putting in place that um, is supposed to, and so this again gets us to the partnership with the chief procurement officer that'll have the terms and conditions in there that offers the lowest price. And then if the salespeople then sell to another component within the department, because I'm sure, Luke, you never experienced this where a component believes that they're smarter than headquarters CIO, um, <laughs> that if they sell to a component organization cheaper, that that will become the new price and that price then conveys out to the rest of the department so we can gain efficiencies and savings from there. The other part though is, is um, working with the CFO and Congress and OMB for us to then be able to reinvest those savings because if we get actual cost savings um, that's envisioned from, for example, like our transfer to uh, the EIS contract from networks. And so the incentives are aligned there, but what we have to do is make sure we have the authority 
to be able to have an IT modernization fund since the working capital has gone forward so that we can invest that to the benefit of the entire department. And then I think some of the other efforts that have gone forward that now actually have meaning but now have raised the bar for services is concepts such as network modernization and cloud first and data uh, center uh, consolidation and optimization have real meaning now as we have moved into this virtual environment. So things where uh, initially DHS was maintaining a telework environment for 5,000 concurrent VPN connections. Now, because the right terms and conditions were in the contracts, as that foundation was laid forth by yourself and other of my predecessors, that we could spin up based on usage to go up to 120,000 concurrent users, right? And then it's gonna be that balancing between what is the right mix between a virtual environment and a premise on-premise environment, which the contracts will allow us to spin back down again. So, so a lot of this is really knowing and analyzing what's there so that we don't have to do some of the things that uh, Luke that was done in the past because the knowledge is there. Uh, well, we have to do a straight across the board cut. What this ends up doing is making the business case and going forward and saying, okay, this is what it costs for all the services that you currently are using across the department. This is what we're paying for them. This is what it costs in order for us to be able to manage the risk and secure those because as you know, the threat landscape has changed. So we've had to change how we are analyzing what is happening through the VPN connections, through those types of things. And this is what it costs. And so it becomes then a senior leadership, you know, question and answer. What do you actually want to cut out of our services, given what we are providing and the cost associated with that? And then how do you balance that against the other priorities of the department? And that's really um, the, the next level of what we're looking at with the department and the budget so that I can answer the question and offer up alternatives when OMB says, hey, you got to take a cut in your top line budget. Um, the idea would be, okay, maybe not necessarily from the CIO overall IT budget, even though, you know, can, uh, we have the largest civilian portfolio and I think we're, we're close to over $7 billion associated with that. But having the right business cases to say, okay, this is what we're supporting. Here's where our analysis is. What do you want us to cut? Yeah, and you know, having that partnership with the CPO's organization so that you can put some variability into those contracts and, uh, and, 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 and be able to offer that, you know, sort of cut type uh, situation and, and be able to execute that back into the contract. And I would imagine that TM, TBM would be a, a big part of sort of, you know, making sure you're, you're uh, you know, comparing the apples to to the apples as opposed to earlier today where somebody was comparing an apple to a chainsaw huh? and I'm still not sure how that happened but it actually did come up in one of our panels uh, I love the idea of the cut keep and reinvest I think that's really important I think every CIO deserves to have that capability and I know that when I was leaving federal service there was a conversation at OMB about just to, you know a price is paid portal Right. So everyone knows what, you know, they, they, they paid for a widget, right? And so you can have some baseline there. I think that's really important. Um, we had a question in the chat about zero trust. And I recognize that zero trust, it kind of reminds me of the conversation we had earlier about 5G, right? It's not just one widget, if you will. It's a constellation of activities, a constellation of technologies, et cetera, that sort of bind together and, and create zero trust, just like with 5G. Uh, the thought around, you know, what is zero trust and what, what are those products and capabilities it has come up. So I'll throw that out to you, Tony, first, since you brought it up. And then Karen, you know, I saw you nod your head earlier when Tony brought it up about sort of where, where are we on this zero trust journey? Well, it's, um, it's still, uh, I think, early days for zero trust. The concept is pretty simple. You know, we in the technology industry, and I've contributed to it over the last, you know, 60 years have focused on maximum interoperability so that anything that you 
crate can be plugged into or networked or interfaced with almost everything else that we've ever created. And our standards uh, bodies, our technology companies um, have done a marvelous job of making things interoperable. Uh, you know, we've hit it out of the park in terms of uh, success on that front. Plug and um, play, right? Yeah, it's just so rare. I mean, when was the last time you had anything that when you plugged it in, it didn't, you know, didn't work? I, I, I just haven't experienced that uh, in probably any number of years. Um, but it, what we didn't do in terms of designing those great interoperable architectures is answer the question, should we interface? Should we connect? Is this a legitimate uh, thing? Um, and and who is it, you know, uh, that we're connecting to? What is this thing? Is it safe? Is it a known quantity? Is it healthy? Is it performing in the way that it should? And so the zero trust concept is um, built up on a couple of ideas. One is uh known good things that you allow to connect one thing to the next and sort of banning everything else um and you know as humans we do this we build up trust over a period of time i've had great interactions with karen i've had great interactions with luke my level of trust with the two of you is really high based on your reputation and based on my interactions with you there are others on this call that I don't know at all and have had no interaction with, and my level of trust is a lot lower. Um, we need that same kind of thing, uh, you know, implemented across the entire ecosystem when it comes to, um, uh, you know, how we allow devices, software, hardware, uh, things to connect uh, one to the next. Now, the problem with all of this is it it's hard to scale this and manage it. Uh, we live in a world where we've got, you know, bazillions of virtual machines and containers and devices and software elements and, and all the rest of it. And managing that zero trust architecture at scale is still one of the big technology challenges that that we face and there's a number of companies that are uh, I think you know starting to do a pretty good job of it but uh, that's really the 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 the, uh, the challenge today you can't do it by manually um, controlling access control lists and and permissions you know in uh, traditional firewalls and those kinds of things it's just that's just not uh, a great approach. Way too many uh, moving parts, and they're moving uh, not even by the uh, the day, by the hour, by the second, quite frankly. Uh, right. you, you've got to have some machine-to-machine -machine sort of uh, uh, brains in the middle of this, I would imagine. Uh, right. Karen, uh, any thoughts on uh, zero trusts as you sure, all embark so on this journey? Yeah, and um, and the department ha has some use cases underway, but I think um, based on some of the things that Tony is, has outlined and then based on my previous work as the Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response and working with the national labs, there's uh, several concepts that can be integrated together in order to be able to get to a risk profile that a department can manage. Because what we're really talking about is balancing, right, the risk tolerance to be able to manage assets. And to Tony's point, um, you know, the internet of things kind of blowing up everything. So anything can connect and, and it's gonna be interoperable. And so the idea of trying to establish a perimeter um, the edge changes every day. So it just depends on what your overall risk tolerance is. So, so with that concept, um, and we're living it today, right? Because risk has gone, the tolerance has gone up in a virtual environment. And I'll give you an example. Um, when we were all on-prem in a department, 
the whole idea of doing remote printing um, from home when you were teleworking was no, because you had to deal with the information controls, control that unclassified information, what kind of printer, how are you controlling the actual document that you print off in your house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now the risk tolerance has gone up and we're working on potential solutions that would allow users to either be able to use their own printers because some of the initial thing was, well, we're gonna buy printers and ship them out to everybody. Well, if we do that, right, in the long run, maybe that's not the right solution. And how do you balance this by allowing us to be able to manage and really look at what is that landscape? How are they doing things through the VPN? And then certain amount of assurances that a person who is then printing from a printer at home, because they're already kind of they're already going across their personal network to make the VPN connection anyway. So how, how are we gonna work that? And the risk tolerance is a little bit higher because not everybody has multiple networks or printers or any of these capabilities for a sustained environment. So we're integrating and testing use cases and then also looking at uh, our target architectures but really spitting out and knitting together segments so that we can say, okay, here's biometrics, here's stuff that we're looking at from artificial intelligence to your point, Luke, about machine to machine because we can't do all of this. And how do we knit those two uh, segment architectures together to a target architecture that clearly identifies how much risk we're willing to live with? So an example that we're looking at right now deals with unclassed video conferencing because we're using it right now. And um, so obviously our risk tolerance is up. So Tony, to your point, it's not, I can't control the platforms because there's a new platform every day. Just saw another one on a commercial the other day. So people are gonna use what is convenient for them to use. But what I can control is what the department is standardizing on. And then what are the interactions and then what are the mitigating um, controls that I can put in place? And one of the things that we're working on with the national labs also was um, CCE, which is uh, consequence driven cybersecurity engineering. So it's really looking at, um, and the easiest way to explain this is, what is the most important thing? The right, the conversation that we're having right now on video conferencing or the actual capability of video conferencing. So I would submit in an unclass environment, especially a forum such as this that is wide open, it's not necessarily the content, but it's the capability because we saw it, right? Like I had to sit there and fix my webcam and change the option, Tony had to deal with the modulation of, of his volume. It has to do with the capability. So the capability, in this particular case is more important. So what kind of things do I have to do? Um, what kind of analysis do I have to have in place? And to Tony, to your point, the operational supply chain, how do I um, then once I selected a solution, how do I continuously uh, and analyze all those different moving parts to make sure as things get upgraded, as things get introduced, that I'm actually managing that supply chain, not just the original software or what Microsoft is doing, but all the interactions across all the different types of capabilities as it interacts with the department. And so that you underway so that we can then channel it back into, okay, this is what it means for us to do zero trust in an unclassed video conferencing capability. This is what it means for us to do zero trust while we're trying to build out artificial intelligence. So I think we're going to see it mature along those lines. Fantastic. Uh, interesting topic. Well, I have to, uh, I have to bring this one up since you sort of touched on it and, um, you know, we're living in a virtual world, right? Uh, does does the world stay virtual as, as we go forward? Is there a, a virtual NOSC uh, so, so someday? I mean, what, what sort of sitting in where you're sitting and the, uh, the role that you're in now and the roles that you've been in, you know, what does that look like? And knowing what you've learned and discovered over the past six months, I ask you both, but I'm gonna start with Karen on this one. What's that look like? Are we just going to live in a virtual world now 
and and uh, and just press forward and and uh, you know uh, get these skills and abilities uh, all over the country that just get sort of get virtually matrix together to defend the country. What's it look like? So this is the Cyber Resilience Summit, right? And so resiliency would allow for us to have a distributed infrastructure that would allow for us oh, yeah. to do. Yeah do the services and so it's about resiliency and i think it the one thing that the environment that we're in has clearly demonstrated that the services my predecessors have put in place are resilient but that we have to continue to make sure that that resiliency is there regardless because as you know the, um we have to keep the operations going and that's what the nosc is about really and so it'll also help with recruitment but um, the other part doesn't mean that everybody has to be, for example, at 7th and D, where I sit. They don't have to be there. Today, I'm coming to you, I'm teleworking from home. Um, it's really about, can we really look at the right mixture of services? Uh, some of the things will still have to be on site, you know that, unless we can come up with, with we challenge industry to do this, right? Um, a classified virtual environment moving forward, right? We have classified um, video conferencing, but we're still limited based on the physical place where we have to be or the physical way that those connections um, occur. So that I think um, does limit us a little bit, but as far class and as far as the work goes forward and and doing a lot of the network operations and keeping that going forward I, I would be remiss if i didn't say yes we're going to continue in this environment especially since we're at the cyber resilience summit fantastic um, very interesting insight there tony you sort of see this from a lot of different dimensions as well what's your perspective on uh, where this all goes well i think couple of things are fairly predictable. One is, uh, you know, for every big wave that happens, and right now we're living through COVID and, you know, we're all having to be virtual whether we want to or not. Um, all of these things have aftershocks and waves that happen. And most of the time, multiple waves over time. So I think immediately once, you know, we get past the current COVID crisis, whenever that is, um, you're going to see a reversion where people will, you know, go back as quickly as they can. In some cases, we humans are herd animals. We love being around other people. We like our football games, our concerts, our, you know, knitting circle, whatever it happens to be, we like to be with other people. But the next wave after that is another reversion, which is, hey, you know, I don't have to be here 100% of the time. I can be here 20% of the time or 30% or whatever is appropriate. And I can also use this great network and technology that we've put in place to connect to people that I couldn't easily connect to uh, in the old world where I felt I had to travel someplace, um, you know, to connect to somebody. So. I think we're going to see, you know, some really exciting things happen. Um, you know, I got to say that even as difficult as some of this still is to use, whether it's turning on your camera or getting the sound right, it's getting better and better and better and better. Um, you know, three years ago, you couldn't have done this the way we're doing this today um, with as few problems. And uh, I look forward to that world. I think that we're going to be able to do some really great things with this technology, but we are also herd animals and we love being with one another and, you know, hoisting a beer or smoking a cigar or cheering on our favorite uh, sports teams. And, and I think that extends into the work environment. There's some things that we just love to do together uh, and it's better to be there in person and other things we'll figure out pretty quickly don't need to be there, you know, not going to be there. Um, you know, we're going to figure out a different way to do those things. You know, any of these big shifts like this always have unintended consequences. Sometimes they're, uh, uh, they're good and sometimes they're, uh, 
Uh, they're not good, but a lot of times there's a, there's always a silver lining that we learn from these uh, activities, and uh, and that's a, that's a great message to end with. Uh, Tracy, uh, Bill, are you out there? We're here. Yeah, thanks much, Luke. Uh, thanks for partnering uh, with okay, me today. Okay, just want to just want to wrap this up. Uh, Bill, over to you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Karen and Tony for bookending this on this this super important day. Uh, Cyber Resilience Summit and uh, giving these closing marks and great thought process around uh, sort of, uh, you know, what we can anticipate into the future. Thank you very much. Bill, over okay. to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Luke, and thanks for partnering with me today to bring the Cyber Resilience Summit to life and uh, and keep it, all on, keep it all on time. Uh, I want to thank everybody who stayed throughout the day, and I want to thank all our speakers. This was really probably the best summit we've had, uh, although we've had some great ones. Uh, but it, even though it was had to be in virtual space, uh, normally at this time we'd all repair out to the upper porch at the Army Navy Club and order some libations from our from from the folks there. Uh, I guess this time you'll just have to go to your refrigerator and hope there's a cold one there. Uh, but I want to thank everybody, especially thank our sponsors for providing the funds for us to uh, create this conference and and bring it all together. And we look forward to seeing you next year at the same time, hopefully at the Army Navy Club this time, where we can have the, the good networking. And in between now and then, figure out how we can keep this country cyber secure. Goodbye. And I want to thank Tracy as well and everyone else that put this thing together. A lot of hard work to pull these things off, as you all know. So thank you very much, Tracy and crew. Goodbye. Bye now.